For League of Legends, Lee Sin has to be one of the most iconic champions in the whole game. And as one of the most recognizable characters in all of gaming no less, his popularity, his presence, and consistency as a viable and top tier meta pick is almost completely unmatched. There aren't many other champions with the fluidity, movement, skill expression, and fun gameplay that he has to offer, even if there are players who don't like playing against him and think that he's unfair, seemingly he's still one of Riot's best designed champions. He is one that will forever be remembered by the player base long after League of Legends dies. But what if I told you, it almost never was. Lee Sin, with his original design, was the first ever cancelled champion. More than 10 years ago, Riot had to pull the plug on his kit, and if it weren't for the community, we may have never seen him come to life. From a champion that Riot fully thought would be dead and never return, to arguably their most famous champion ever. This is the story of Lee Sin. Wait, did, did you see that? Play that back, hang on, one sec. If you haven't seen this before, this is Riot's first official in-game trailer for League of Legends, and this was released all the way back on June 2nd, 2009. It's honestly crazy how far this game has come. This trailer shows some of the original graphics for those original casts of champions. Just look at some of the graphics. I think those of you who played back then will remember Soraka as probably being the most hideous champion in the game. You see, back in the day, back in the OG days, this was way before everything was all anime and weeby, back when Riot didn't have to sell out to neckbeards. Look at the difference in what Soraka skins we get now and how she looks these days compared to the way that she used to look. Of course, we have the old Scion in there too, looking as beast as ever. Boy, he's come a long way in his champion's history. He also deserves one of these videos as well. But let's run that clip one more time. Who is this? Because the list of all of the champions that were released before this video came out has no other oddballs. The whole lineup seems to be there. Except for this guy. This champion was known as the Blind Monk. League of Legends is not short of cancelled champions, but it's just been a very long time since we've seen any others. This is a look at some of the champions that have been scrapped. The good thing is that we've seen a few of these champions come to life years later, after the community begged to release Ao Shin, a dragon-like character, years later he turned into a Relian soul. Seth was pretty much just the first version of Azir, so he wasn't really cancelled, and Eagle Rider was just the male counterpart to Quinn, we just ended up receiving her kit instead of his. Another good thing is that it's thought that a lot of these champions have at least had some of their concepts used in sparing ways throughout a bunch of other champions' kits. For example, Priscilla the Spider Queen was cancelled, but Elise is also the Spider Queen. The community support, however, for the Blind Monk champion. Now, that guy's kit must have been cool. There's no way he should have been cancelled, and in 2009 and 2010, they would beg for Riot to release him. I've always found this to be super cool. This is a picture of one of the earliest possible builds of League of Legends, way back when it was in very, very early stages, and this was the original blind monk going by the name of Shizun. Look how different this is. But anyway, the straw hat and wooden staff version of the blind monk would not be final, and the version that we would see in the trailer would end up being this one. This version, however, would be cancelled, but then brought back to life in the form of a skin, traditional Lee Sin. This skin is what he was intended to look like, which is pretty cool that you can still play it today. Maybe they should actually release a traditional Soraka skin. 
As season 1 started, Riot began work on releasing The Blind Monk, a title that many people at this point knew of, but no one was exactly sure what his kit would look like. And towards the end of March in 2011, we finally got his champion name for the first time, known as Lee Sin. Since he was scheduled to be released on April 1st, Riot thought that a bit of a unique champion spotlight might do the trick for him, something that really shows his true power for a champion being released on April Fools. Lee Sin is a ranged melee, tanky DPS, assassin, mage, tank, support, jungler. He excels at everything. Lee Sin's hidden passive is blindness. Your entire screen is blurry while playing him at all times, but he is immune to spells such as Teemo's Blinding Dart and Nocturne's Paranoia. This champion spotlight was hilarious, but we would eventually get the real spotlight a few days later, and then on April 1st, as promised, he would hit the live servers. Upon his release, he was thought to be pretty underpowered, so he would quickly be hotfix buffed, but it turns out that he would be too strong because of that, so then on the very next patch, he was nerfed. This wasn't a great start, and would end up speaking volumes for how the champion would go through ups and downs for the rest of his League of Legends lifespan. His original kit was extremely overloaded, and even though he's still pretty overloaded to this day, honestly by modern standards he's not that bad considering the champions that are put into the game now. Back then, however, he was pretty crazy. A few of the things that he had back then that he doesn't now are things like his W could shield his own minions, the second part not only gave him spell vamp and lifesteal like it does now, but it also gave him armor. His W's range was longer at 750 range, and Lee Sin's E called Cripple used to literally cripple his opponents, decreasing their attack speed. During his early days, one thing that was really interesting is the story behind these two patches back to back. On version 1.0.0.120, Lee Sin would have his ward jump be removed from his W. This was intended by Riot because Lee Sin was jumping to invisible wards like the green wards, so it wasn't exactly clear to the enemy what was going on. From their perspective, it just looked like he was dashing wherever he wanted and they didn't know what he was targeting. Riot would remove the mechanic altogether, but because of the feedback that it ruined a lot of his mobility and fluidity in his kit, the outcry to bring it back was massive. So on the very next patch, Riot re-added in the ward jumping, but it made it so it revealed the ward for two seconds. This is a much better change and approach from them, and I'm glad that they listened to the community because, as you will see later on, ward jumping would be vital in the story of Lee Sin and some of the mechanics that people would learn. During the first year of his existence, Lee Sin was a fun and exciting champion that players knew was pretty broken and overpowered, but honestly could display immense skill with. He could be picked in both solo lanes as well as the jungle role pretty effectively, but he would eventually find his footing being a dominant early game focused pressure jungler during Season 2. Pro junglers started to be more efficient with their pathing early game as Lee Sin, and they became much more mechanically gifted on the champion with more and more practice. Of this era, there probably was not a more famous Lee Sin player than Diamond Prox of Moscow 5. За кого ты мейнишь? Кто твой самый любимый персонаж в Лиге Легенд? Мой любимый персонаж в Лиге Легенд это, конечно же, Лисин. Син. Самый трудный, самый интересный, самый вариативный. Спасибо Риотам за его. But they are going to get in on towards Gosu Pepper. Could this be first blood? There comes the Lee Sin, the huge collection, and there is the first blood from Lee Sin. They will take down. They're in a great counter gang. Benji can fall as well. Can they finish it off? There was a flash from Genji, and the wow. final hit from Diamond Prox. Right down here, and the chase is on. Soaz does not really have a good way of making it out at this point. He deals as much damage as possible in the brush to Darien, but it's not going to be enough. Diamond making that one happen. A lot of damage on Sven Skurin coming out from that turret, and they do get him. Here comes Diamond, he's going to try and track around the side. Flashies gets the Sonic Wave and takes him down a range. Punk's ready back in there, and now Freddy's in trouble. Darien didn't really read the play. I don't think he was expecting this to work out so well, but Diamond Brock proves the king of the jungle is still alive on Lee Sin. That was fantastic. Diamond's Lee Sin play would inspire a bunch of other pros to pick up the champion, as well as all of the new players coming into the game wanting to learn how to play Lee Sin just like their favorite pro. For most of 2012, he was a solid champion, but Riot had big plans for Season 3 and the launch of the new jungle. 
In preparation for the new strength the junglers would have with the easier to clear jungle, as well as having much more optimization with a hunter's machete being added, Riot would go ahead and preemptively nerf Lee Sin, as they figured he would be too strong with the new jungle. And it turns out, they were right. And for those of you who remember a time where Lee Sin was the best jungler in the game, and defined the entire jungle role, that would be as soon as we saw Season 3. Season 3's jungle was much easier to clear during the early game, which in turn you would think means that more non-viable junglers will be able to clear. When the camps are easier to clear, then more champions can jungle, right? Awesome. Well, there might be tons of new meta junglers. However, this idea is kind of a double-edged sword, because when the jungle is also easier to clear, it means that junglers that do have a good clear run through their jungle at lightning speed and come out at full health, and then they invade the weaker jungler. This would be the defining property of why Lee Sin not only controlled the jungle role, but was the Lee Sin factor. If your jungle champion of choice couldn't survive Lee Sin's invades and coming into your jungle, then your champion sucks and isn't viable. Lee Sin's dominance and relevance in the game would be unmatched during Season 3 and Season 4. His presence in competitive play basically tells the whole story. During Season 3, he had a 60% presence, and during Season 4, he was even higher, at 70%. And as if Lee Sin wasn't popular enough, there would be another player who would show the world just how much better we could all be at the champion. Mostly because he would revolutionize Lee Sin by inventing and perfecting a very flashy, advanced mechanical play that was actually very useful too. This combo would end up being known as an insect, named after the player who invented it. For those who don't know, Lee Sin has two forms of mobility in his kit one with his Q and one with his W. Lee Sin can use his Q to dash to a target when he hits him with the ability, or for his W he can target mostly everything that is an ally, allied minions, champions, or even vision wards. For those using wards for mobility, this was already vital for his kit, but if you combine those two forms of mobility together with his ultimate, which kicks back enemies, you have a way to essentially get the enemy carries displaced all the way back into your team. This type of thing back in Season 3 and Season 4 was almost unheard of, but funny enough, now it's the norm. Even the lower tier players in ranks such as Bronze, Silver, and Gold can execute an insect a good portion of the time. The player base has just gotten a lot better overall over the years. This development once again brought upon even more popularity for Lee Sin, and really had a snowball effect for his beloved kit. In, wards back, kicks it. That is so hard to execute. Even though Europe tried to calm wooden made really everyone sit on the Rumble Ultimate, they'd already lost their AD carry, and they burned all their CC really as a counter initiation, so the rest of Korea just chased down Europe. In Season 4, he would finally, after more than a year of being the top dog in the jungle, be dropped down a peg with some nerfs, and this would impact him for quite a while. He wouldn't be the same for a long time. It wasn't just the nerfs that did that though, because Riot once again had a new plan for Season 5. A new jungle was coming. We would see Riot change the jungle doing the opposite of their approach in Season 3, by now making the jungle much harder to clear. For Season 5, it brought us a bunch of changes, most notably the new map, and fittingly, an updated map graphically, we needed an updated gameplay element too, with the new jungle. Wraiths were replaced by the Raptor Camp, and the White Camp had to become the Gromp. This new version of the jungle was not only harder to clear than all other seasons before it, but also farming junglers would become insanely good, because junglers that were spending a lot of time and health clearing their own jungles would honestly not have enough health to make ganks viable early game. I specifically remember playing top lane during this time period, and sometimes it just felt like you wouldn't be ganked all that much, and even if you did, you had a solid chance of 1v2ing the jungler and top laner, because the jungler would just come in with so much less health. This made early game pressure junglers almost obsolete, Lee Sin being the main focus in that equation. It was so hard for him to have that up-tempo early game that he wanted, and he couldn't pressure the map enough to have a serious impact on the outcome of the game. On top of the map in the new jungle itself not favoring him, two more champions would also be new in town, and cause Lee Sin to be outclassed. One in the form of a brand new champion which was Rek'Sai, and the other in the form of a reborn Nidalee, who was now a jungle champion. 
At the beginning of Season 5, Rek'Sai would be released, and she's always had a good jungle matchup into Lee Sin. And other than Kalista, who I've already made a video about before, Rek'Sai was the second most played champion for that entire season. She was easily the most contested jungler, who did everything that Lee Sin couldn't, and on top of that was a direct counterpick. Nidalee, on the other hand, after years of being a laner, was now a jungler and was the ideal early game pressure jungler, with a much faster and healthier clear than Lee Sin, who was also more useful than him late game because she offered a decent heal for her teammates and some poke. These two junglers overall were more well-rounded during that time, and Lee Sin didn't really see any play. This would lead to him receiving a massive buff, something that he really wasn't used to after all of the years of nerfs, and he would slowly creep back into the meta as we got to Season 6 and Season 7. Season 6 was the king of the jungle era, when junglers ruled the map. If you don't believe me, just ask Tarzan. During that year, we got the new keystones, and one of those masteries was ridiculously good for all junglers, Lee Sin included, which was Strength of the Ages. This gave junglers health as they cleared their camps, so hard farmers got this really fast and scaled up with free health, and ganking junglers got early game champions like Lee Sin and Nidalee to be much more tanky come late game and acting as more utility. In general, jungling has never really been as powerful as it was during this time, so of course that means that Lee Sin would come back. Him and Nidalee would constantly be fighting over king and queen of early game prowess, both with their respective strengths and weaknesses, though in general Nidalee was thought to be more overpowered, thus she would be picked more often. Another addition to the jungle was one that Lee Sin absolutely loved, which was now the defunct Green Smite. The Tracker's Knife was a jungle item that gave you wards, finally helping Lee Sin build an additional item. For most of his history, Lee Sin would build a support item called Sightstone. The fact is that the gold investment, even though the item was not really meant for junglers, was so worth it because of the added mobility in the wards that you got. Even low elo player Lee Sin's would build it, and if that's not proof enough, I don't know what is. Sightstone helped Lee execute more ward hops throughout the game, but at a cost of a gold sink as well as an inventory slot. Tracker's Knife fixed this problem for Lee Sin, which essentially felt like Raya created an item just for him. With the new jungle, Tracker's Knife, and a couple of buffs, he would find his groove once again and was a solid A or S tier jungler for most of Season 6 and Season 7. However, due to its extreme dominance over competitive play, Tracker's Knife would be removed. The item simply gave too much vision, and pros were way too good at using it. Riot ended up feeling like it slowed down the game a lot. Players had too much vision, therefore they would be playing far too safe for any action to happen. For obvious reasons, with the removal of Tracker's Knife, Lee Sin would once again have a slump. And it hurt even more than the Season 5 slump. Take a look at this. Remember earlier when we said that Lee Sin was at the height of his power at a 70% presence in Season 4, and then one season later in Season 5 he was pretty underpowered and thought to be outclassed? Well, he saw a drop in his play, holding a 31% presence in Season 5. Even still, while 31% is less than half of what he used to be, he was still relevant. However, Season 8, with the removal of trackers and jungle receiving nerfs with the horrible Scuttlecrab patch that year, Lee Sin dropped from a 40% presence in Season 7 to a 7% presence in Season 8. The jungle role, and even more specifically Lee Sin, would take a big hit, and for most of Season 8, he really struggled to find any type of play. Most of pro play jungling in 2018 revolved around either picking a supportive or tanky jungler, and, well, funneling. The idea of saying that jungle is not a role anymore, just a second support. Which is not a good time for a jungler who is completely reliant on winning the game before 15 minutes and playing extremely aggressive. So for one of the poster characters in this game being that bad during 2018 and into 2019, it should come as no surprise that he received a lot of buffs to help him climb out of being in a pretty bad spot. We start on patch 8.3, with a very small base health regen buff. However, a month and a half later, we would see some really important and big changes for our old monk friend. 8.6 would see Lee Sin's Q have its range increased by 100, which was a huge buff, because this opened up all new possibilities and opportunities for ganking and playmaking that we really hadn't seen before, and Lee Sin mains went wild on the practice tool trying to figure out all new angles that were possible to gank from. 
On the very same patch, he also had a damage increase on his ultimate and a buff to his passive. For patch 8.11, he had another buff to his passive, as well as all of his abilities receiving a nice quality of life change, allowing them to be timed easier and knowing exactly when the ability is going to expire. This not only helps new Lee Sin players, but also the old veterans to just have a more clear gameplay experience. To follow up with that, on the very next patch for 8.12, Lee Sin received even more buffs, and a couple of weeks later, on 8.15, he saw his Q get a damage rework, making it so that damage-heavy builds would be more rewarding to play, and overall it was thought to be a buff to his kit's main source of damage. Next season, on 9.15, he would once again get more damage buffs, and finally right before Worlds, he would get one more buff indicating that Riot wants to see him being played during the World Championship. And, let's just say, that call would be answered, in a huge way. This is Tian. He's a 19-year-old from China, who plays in the League of Legends Chinese Pro League called the LPL. He's the jungler for a team called FPX, and this year they dominated China. During the summer split, they racked up a bunch of wins on their way to winning the regular season with a record of 14-1. This team was extremely well-rounded, and coming into the World Championship for 2019, they were clearly a team to watch out for. Coming into the group stage, they did very well, going 5-2 and, and topping their group, but this was seen as the weakest group in the tournament. Still though, they proved themselves to be a contender, so we made it into the knockout stages. They would defeat the second place team out of Europe in the quarterfinals, beating Fnatic 3-1. This was a good start, but the true test would come next. IG, Invictus Gaming, another Chinese team, and the defending world champions and they would try to stand in the way of FPX making it to the finals. This series between two Chinese powerhouses would be intense, fast-paced, and all around a great series, but they would end up beating the favorited IG 3-1 in a pretty convincing fashion. The only game that they lost during the series, in fact, was the one that Tian was on Lee Sin, and he didn't play particularly well during that game. After they advanced to the finals, we did know that Tian's Kiana was probably his best champion and was extremely solid, and overall he was a pretty good player. Here's the thing, Tian up until the finals had only played Lee Sin a handful of times in his professional career. Up until that point, he was 7-6, and six, an average Lee Sin player who had around a 50% win rate on the champion. He was obviously solid, but not anything that people would say is a game changer champion for him. So, as expected, G2 knew that his Kiana was excellent, so they banned it every single game, forcing Tian to play something else. And what would end up happening was extraordinary. There goes the teleport, the teleport, oh! the kill! Tian, you beauty, gets the double kill for FPX! Caps goes down, it's another one, but they're gonna damage from Wonder, he's looking for LWX, Gim Goon turns around with a parlay, LWX! Entrance into the river and G2, they cannot find anything yet, they're chasing on Chris, they've got themselves, finally one more kill, but the temple comes up from Gim Goon, he doesn't have the charge available, all of a sudden Mickey's down, oh! oh, two, three, LWX can find the triple, Tian gets another, G2 are aced! 22 minutes and FBX will march down mid lane. Tian and his Lee Sin gameplay will go down in League of Legends history as one of the best finals performances we've ever seen. And the sky is the limit for this young FPX team and their rising star in the jungle. Speaking of China and Lee Sin, there's even more to tell here. It's been a really long time since the days of Insect in discovering new Lee Sin mechanics, but it turns out that the Chinese are just on top of the Lee Sin world right now and are always finding new things in his kit. Pretty recently, Chinese Lee Sin players have been shocking the world and blowing up on YouTube with their unmatched mechanical ability. These guys are unreal on Lee Sin, and their plays are extremely impressive. On top of just being sick on the champion, there's also a new combo that was found out this year, dubbed the Ghost Kick. It's extremely difficult to execute and is very precise, but it allows you to ward hop away while you kick someone, and if done correctly, the enemy never even sees the kick coming. They can't even see Lee Sin flying in and then leaving. Check it out from the perspective of the Yasuo when he gets kicked away.
This play is nuts. And the crazy thing to think about is who knows what this play will be like in a couple of years. Will it become the norm for expert Lee Sin players even though at this point in time it's extremely rare? Will it be normalized for most of the Lee Sin community much like the insect has become? Only time will tell us that answer. What more can somebody say about Lee Sin? He's dynamic, flashy, and versatile. He's overloaded and broken, but everybody knows it and accepts it. Because what else would League of Legends be without his presence? And it just as easily could have been, too. Had us, the players, the community, the redditors, and the forum posters not begged the devs to release the blind monk, Maybe Tian doesn't win the MVP, maybe FPX doesn't win Worlds, maybe Insect doesn't have a legendary name in the League of Legends world, maybe Diamond Prox wouldn't have been the best jungler in the world, maybe we wouldn't have all of these awesome stories. And that's what's so great about hindsight. We have more than 7 years of Lee Sin being as awesome and popular as he is, and it could have easily been told to us that no, he's not coming out. It makes you kind of wonder, those other cancelled champions that we talked about at the beginning, Rob Blackblade, Averdrian, Omen, would their fate have been the same? Would we be praising Team Liquid and Doublelift as he lifts the World Championship trophy for his insane Omen gameplay that finally won a World Championship for NA? <laughs> Chaos Theory is kind of funny like that. How the course of history changes forever because a rioter decided that the Blind Monk was worth finishing and worth developing. Speaking of finishing, thank you for finishing this video. Please like and subscribe, and I will see you all next time.